In this demonstration, we'll be using uh, the moose finite element uh, code to solve a simple structural mechanics problem. So we start off that uh, this is the official moose webpage, www.mooseframework.org. And you should start with the getting started section. They have instructions for Linux and Mac as well as Windows 10. Um, I'll be using Windows 10 machine. Uh, they have some setup stuff that you should follow through, and then you'll proceed to their Conda install instructions, which are the same as their Linux and Mac instructions. I've previously built this already. It should take about 15 or 20 minutes. So I'll start uh, with this section here, um, where after you've already installed it and you open up a new terminal session, you run Conda activate moose. So here I've got my Ubuntu session open in my Windows 10 WSL. And I run conda activate moose. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create an application uh, based off moose. And so we're just going to copy this text here. Note that I've installed uh, my moose to the home projects moose directory like they suggested. And we're going to call this app struct mech. Um, and so you can call it whatever you want, but we're going to do this. There are some instructions if you wanted to have your code hosted on, say, GitHub or in an internal Git repository, but we're not going to do that here. Um, the Stork app goes ahead and it creates my directory struct mech, um, where it's got my code, and, or it's, it's got um, some source files. And then here we're going to modify the make file um, to use the default um, mod, uh, physics modules in Moose. We're going to use the tensor mechanics package, and we could, you know, say you use contact if we wanted. Um, but in this problem, I just happen to be I know that I'm not going to have any contact, so no sense uh, compiling that. So I'm going to set that to no. Uh, but I could certainly make a uh, an app that's very similar to Abacus by selecting uh, various physics modules if I wanted. Uh, but this is going to be a very bland stru uh, structural mechanics. We'll go ahead and create a directory called problems where I'm going to, uh, say, just create some problems that maybe I want to solve, so like this piston, for instance. Um, I'm going to go ahead and copy. I've got an input directory or input file that I've already uh, put together um, that is at this directory in my Windows machine. So I can access that through slash mount and then see, and I just follow the path that we can see in my Visual Studio code. And I'm just going to copy that input uh, file to this directory. And we can see if we uh, VI that file, we can see that this file has been copied over to um, the file space for my Ubuntu build. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll just minimize this for now. We'll come back to this input file um, in a little bit. Um, what we're going to go ahead now is we're going to go ahead and, and we'll make, uh, so we'll go ahead and compile this app. I could have done this as soon as I'd you know, it's right after I've done my uh, stork. Um, note that I'm going to here use four cores uh, to compile. Um, but uh, this usually takes a couple minutes. And we'll just wait for this to complete. All right. So while that's finishing compiling, we'll go ahead and we'll make our mesh. So here I'm going to use Trellis, which is the commercial uh, variant of Sandia's uh, Qubit uh, meshing uh, software. Go ahead and we'll import our step uh, file for this piston. Um, so here I'm going to use, I'm going to use Trellis, um, but again, you can use Qubit. You can also use something like Gmesh or some other compatible uh, meshing software. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to decompose this into uh, quadrants for symmetry. So we'll do some web cuts as the terminology in uh, Qubit or Trellis. Um, it would be partitions and say something like Abacus. We'll go ahead and we'll delete um, these volumes and leave just the green volume. And what we'll do now is we'll go ahead and create uh, what's called a block in the Xs terminology, which is essentially a contiguous set of elements with a um, contiguous material property assigned to it. So they're all the same element type as well as the same material assigned. 
So we just chose that volume, and we named that volume, by the way, Piston. Um, and as we do additional web cuts, uh, Qubit or Trellis, they will, they will keep the hierarchy of the block assignment. So we won't have to go through and reselect volumes. And now go ahead and create side sets for us to apply load and boundary conditions on. Uh, and I'm going to start with a side set that's called X-Min. And this is where, if we look at our, in the input file, um, that my I've specified to use for like the symmetry condition with the Dirichlet boundary condition, this boundary with the name of X-Min. So Moose will look for the boundary or the side set whose name is X-Min. And so we'll go ahead and we'll create a surface or choose a surface as you can see at the X minimum value. We'll create another side set, which is going to be called Y min. And so we'll choose this surface here on the bottom. And then finally of these uh, boundary conditions, we'll go ahead and specify uh, Z min which is going to be these two surfaces. So I can control select uh, to add to my selection these two surfaces. And then uh, finally, we'll have a load condition. Uh, and the boundary here in my uh, input deck I've called load underscore surf. And so we will choose a um, another surface to have, um, or a side set choosing a surface that's called load surf. So side set four paste in our name, and select this uh, surface here on the underside. OK. So you might think, OK, well, I've defined all my side sets and blocks. Let's go ahead and create our mesh. And so if we select our volume to mesh, and we just naively say mesh it, we'll see that it'll fail. And so even though Trellis and Qubit and Abacus and other codes are considered automatic hex meshers, uh, they really, you have to decompose the geometry into simple topologies that then um, Qubit Trellis, Abacus, Gmesh, whatever, have algorithms to automatically then mesh those simpler components. So here we're going to do is um, we're going to start to just trim or uh, kind of break this, uh, this geometry up into some subcomponents. Um, and so you can see that there are multiple different types of web cuts we can use. Uh, I'm trying to search for, well, let's do, go ahead and do a cylinder radius first. So let's just trim off this little section here, not trim, but partition it on the, with a cylinder. So here you can see what the cut is that we're going to do. And we can see that now if we were to choose this volume, we could actually mesh that volume. So that's Qubit being an automatic hex mesher. It knows how to mesh that volumes geometry or topology. And so now what we're going to do is we're actually going to slice um, using a plane in ZX, um, kind of like on that little nub feature. Um, so let's see if we can find, um, I'm looking for, yeah. Let's go ahead. Yeah, the sheet extended from surface. So we will choose this top surface on this little, um, on this little uh, interior little nub. We can preview that plane that we're going to be cutting with, and we'll go ahead and apply that. And so now we have three volumes. Now this purple volume, Qubit also knows how to mesh. Um, so we can see we can mesh this top volume with a nice coarse mesh, and we can also mesh this volume here. Now you can start to see maybe one issue with a non-conforming mesh. And let's just, um, we'll elucidate this a little bit further in a little bit. But let's do one other cut too. Let's maybe uh, completely segregate this nub off from this interior. So here we'll choose two surfaces to extend and chop off. So if we just delete all of our meshes, we should see these four volumes. So, now, if we choose to mesh all the volumes, um, but we, one of the things we actually do is we can actually set different sizes for each of these volumes. So let's just go ahead and set uh, several different sizes just to give ourselves some 
some disparity uh, here. And if we mesh these, what you'll notice is a highly varying grading of the mesh. You can see that we have elements that don't actually, the nodes don't line up. So this would be considered a non-conforming mesh. In something like Abacus, you would use like a tie constraint uh, to tie degrees of freedom between these mesh elements. Um, some, in some uh, methods, you'll have elements that can have hanging nodes, but we don't have that here. So what we'll do is we'll have to imprint and then merge these uh, volumes together so that then their mesh seeds will be shared across their interfaces. And so now if we just remove those mesh sizes, if we just mesh this geometry here, we'll see that all of the nodes of all the elements they, at the interfaces, uh, they line up with their, with their neighbors. And so this is what we would call a conforming uh, hex mesh. And we can kind of see there's some large element distortion on the blue volume. So we'll do one additional cut uh, with a rotated plane. Um, and so we'll rotate this plane 45 degrees. And actually, you know, we, we want to make sure that we don't cut the uh, yellow uh, volume because um, we have to have a wedge element there. And we just want all hexes here. So we'll just partition um, kind of those outer volumes. And if we, again, do our imprint um, and merge of the volumes, we'll now get uh, recapture our uh, conforming hex mesh. So this is a, a fairly coarse mesh, uh, which is fine for the purposes that we'll have here, as well as uh, the input file has some mesh refinement. And again, we can see that our, our block assignments and our side set assignments have been carried through all of the partitioning. So it's generally a good idea um, to set these before you do your um, partitioning. And it saves you a lot of clicking later. So we'll go ahead and we'll export now this mesh. And so we'll call this mesh piston underscore course. We'll just save this to the, uh, uh, to the desktop here. So it's easy for us to, to get back over to the Ubuntu. So piston underscore course, and then we'll uh, say that as the X's format. And if we wanted to, we could save it as a net CDF file, and that would be something that you could then use uh, various net CDF formats or libraries in, in various programming languages to, to import. Uh, note that I chose that name because again, in my input file, uh, I specified the file name to be piston underscore course dot e. So what remains for us now is to copy that exes file into our problems directory, right where our input file is. So we'll go ahead and we'll copy from uh, the Windows mount. So mount C users, uh, my username, and then uh, desktop. And we'll just copy it right to this directory. Now, um, We'll go ahead and we'll run our submission, but first let's just look, take a look at like syntax rules. So um, up a directory is where our compiled executable has been saved or has been compiled to. And so it was compiled to um, an executable that was struct mech-opt. Um, obviously there, so we're gonna run this dash H for help to see our various input um, arguments we can have. So you can see the general usage the code and then options. And uh, so we'll use a flag of dash i and then feed it our input file. So that'll be the piston params i. And you know, for in parallel runs, you might, um, you, you'll use MPI to run various processes. And if you wanted to, for each process, you could have it run uh, multiple threads. So you'd run, say, one process with eight threads, or you could run eight processes, each with one thread and various different other combinations. And uh, to, uh, to run a, a parallel job, you'll need to use uh, an MPI uh, uh, execution. 
So let's go ahead and let's run this job with dash i and then our uh, uh, piston params dot i. We'll just hit enter on this and then we'll start to see some output logging to the screen. And so here, Moose is now tracking our convergence for us. Green uh, colors mean that uh, Moose is pr uh, uh, heuristically telling us that our problem is converging at acceptable rates. Uh, if the colors were yellow, then they would tell us that it seems to be converging, but maybe at a suboptimal rate, and then red are non-converging. And so we're just stepping through at a... Uh, uh, fixed uh, time steps of 0.1 and we're just going to iterate up to uh, a pseudo time step of up to 1, so 10 total steps. And again, this is running on one core and one process. And which is nice to show us a little performance graph if we wanted. So now what we'll do is we have all these output files. So again, these dash S's uh, denote um, remeshed um, outputs. Uh, so we'll copy all of these exit files uh, by using the wildcard operator back to our desktop here. And then to visualize these results, we'll open up uh, Paraview. Paraview supports native uh, visualization of exit formats. And so we'll choose our base uh, piston params underscore out dot e to load, and we'll choose all the variables. And if we use the representation of surface with edges, we can see our mesh elements. And then we can say color by pointwise data of displacements. And the component here is the total magnitude. And let's just go ahead and recolor rescale our color bar over all the time steps. You just kind of notice we have our, our remesh here. And if we play this through, well, it's kind of fast and uh, just not much use to us. Let's go ahead and actually increase the, the displacement magnitude that Pairview is showing us. So here we're scaling everything by 10. And if we want more deformation, to be visualized, we can displace it by 20. Let's go ahead and go up to 40. And again, if we step through, we can see our mesh updating um, time step by time step. We can actually also view the error fraction that's used in the calculation of which element regions to refine. So the red regions are regions where Moose has flagged for refine this region. And so we can see um, from step to step, the red regions become blue regions with a refined mesh as it steps through, based on our error indicator in the uh, input file. We can also color by, say, von Mises dress. And you'll recall that uh, stresses are, are typically defined at or used at the, uh, at the quadrature points. Um, and so you typically you give like a single value to an entire element. Um, but you can also, if a pair of you use a filter to, to convert cell data into point data through extrapolation. And so we can choose, this is the cell-based version of von Mises and this is the point-based version of von Mises. And this gives out maybe a bit of a smoother um, uh, color plot. But again, you have to be careful to make sure that you know it your data and your visualizations actually sharing to the customer. So that's the uh, uh, this tutorial, and I hope that uh, you find this useful.